Ay, bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Alhamdulillah, back with our journey through Zad al-Mustaqna. And uh, we've left off where the author is going to speak now about the forbidden times in the salah. So the author, he says, with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَأَوْقَاتٌ nahi خَمْسَةٌ The author, he mentions that there are five forbidden times. The first of them, مِنْ طُلُوعِ الْفَجْرِ الثَّانِي إِلَى طُلُوعِ الشَّمْسِ From the second fajr, which is known as the true fajr, a fajr sadiq, until the sun has risen. So in the hadith in, collected by Imam Tabarani and Sheikh uh, Imam Al-Albani in Silsilah Al-Sahihah, the Prophet Sallallahu said, إِذَا طَلَعَ الْفَجْرِ فَلَا صَلَاةَ إِلَّا رَكْعَةَ الْفَجْرِ When dawn of fajr comes about, then there's no prayers which are allowed except for the raka'ah, the two units of fajr. And this is the mu'tamad opinion of the madhab, the relied upon opinion of the madhab, that as soon as the time for fajr has come in, then all of the salawat are forbidden, except for the two sunnah of fajr and the two obligatory units of fajr. This is the mu'tamad opinion uh, in the madhab, the relied upon opinion. Uh, another riwayah, in the madhab held by the majority of the non hanbalis and also one riwaya in the madhab is that the prohibition time, the dislike time for praying here, the prohibition time starts not at the time of fajr when the adhan comes in but rather once the person has prayed the fajr salah. So according to the second riwaya and that of the majority of other scholars, non hanbali scholars, they say it's not from the time of the Adhan, which is the relied upon opinion in the Madhab. They say rather it's from the time when you have prayed the Fajr. Once you've prayed Fajr, then thereafter, no other prayers are allowed for you to pray. Tayyib. So the author, he's holding uh, that the opinion is that from Tulu al-Fajr, that as soon as the time of Fajr comes in, that you cannot pray uh, anything apart from the two Sunnah of Fajr and the two obligatory units of the Fajr prayer, okay? And then he says, إِلَى طُلُوعِ shams," And this continues till طُلُوعِ shams," until the sun rises. What they mean here is that if the disk of the sun appears above the horizon, any part of the disk of the sun appears above the horizon, then the forbidden time, the first forbidden time ends there, okay? So from the start of the Adhan until part of the disk, appears above the horizon once the sun has started to rise. That's the first forbidden time that the author mentions. Then he says, مِن طُلُوعِهَا حَتَّى تَرْتَفِعَ قِيدَ From the time that the disk of the sun has started to appear above the horizon, even if it be a little bit, until now it continues to rise to the length of a spear. قِيدَ This means that basically if you were to look with the naked eye at the horizon, and you would see the sun, then in your estimation, it would be the length of a spear, the length of a spear that would be in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. And some of the ulama, they said it would be the length of a meter. So when the uh, sun is above the horizon, uh, a length of a meter and above, then that is the time when the uh, prohibition stops. Okay? So the first time of the prohibition was from when the sun, when the adhan of Fajr is given, when the time of Fajr starts, until part of the disk of the sun starts to rise above the horizon. That's the first time. The second time is from this part when the sun's disk is appearing above the horizon until it rises, until it rises the length of a spear, meaning your estimation with the naked eye. Okay, so when you look at the horizon, it's as though the sun is a meter or so above the horizon. And that's when the prohibition time stops and you can then start to pray Salatul Duha, etc. Okay, so this time, the second uh, time that I mentioned, when it rises from sunrise, from when a bit of the sun's disk appears to it actually fully rising to a spare's length, that takes around 10 to 15 minutes as estimated by Sheikh Uthaymeen and some other scholars. It takes about 10 to 15 minutes. The author now mentions the third uh, time when it's disliked or forbidden to pray. He says, وَإِنْدَ قِيَامِهَا حَتَّى تَزُولُ 
when the sun is in the middle of the sky, okay, in the zenith of the sky, until it starts to move. And when it starts to move, that is the time of Zawal, when you can again start to pray. So when the sun has stopped in the middle of the sky, and this lasts for roughly two to three minutes, and then the sun starts to move again towards the, uh, towards the Maghrib, towards the west, okay, that is when the Dhuhr time comes in. By that time, when it was in the middle of the sky for around two to three minutes before it moved towards the west, uh, you couldn't pray in that time. It's forbidden to pray. But when it does move, then that allows you to then pray Salatul Dhuhr. Tayyib. The author, he says, وَمِن صَلَاتِ الْعَصْرِ إِلَىٰ غُرُوبِهَا The fourth time is from having prayed Salatul Asr until the sun has set. Tayyib, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in Sahih Muslim and the Hadith of Abi Sa'id, لا صلاة بعض العصر حتى تغرب الشمس There is no prayer after Asr until the sun has set. That is the fourth time. The fifth time that the author mentions, he says, وَإِذَا شَرَعَتْ فِيهِ حَتَّى يَتِمْ he mentions here, وَإِذَا شَرَعَتْ فِي حَتَّى يَتِمْ What he means here is that when the sun, uh, a part of the sun's disk has now gone below the horizon in setting, okay, from that time now, it becomes forbidden for you to pray until the sun's disk has completely disappeared from the horizon, okay? So the fifth time is from when part of the sun's disk, the bottom part, goes below the horizon, until all of the sun's disk becomes hidden from the horizon and we cannot see the sun anymore. Okay, so that time is when it's forbidden for us to pray. That is the fifth time. Another riwayah in the madhab of Imam Ahmad held by Ibn Qudama and Majd ibn Taymiyyah and others, as mentioned by Fahad, Sheikh Fahd al-Matiri in his explanation, he says that the other riwayah, the other narration in the madhab is that this fifth forbidden time starts when the sun starts its descent, meaning when the sun, it starts to lean towards its descent, it starts to lean towards descending towards the horizon. And it's not as, uh, it doesn't start when part of the sun's disk is below the horizon, as mentioned by our author, Al-Hijawi. Okay, so the second rewire in the madhab is that it starts when the sun starts to uh, lean, uh, yamil, it starts to lean towards the sunset okay so now what i'm going to do quickly is give a summary of these uh, five forbidden times as mentioned by sheikh abdul salam uh, in his explanation so the summary is that basically to simplify it from the time that fajr has come in okay when the adhan of fajr is given until the sun rises uh, above the horizon to the length of a spear and we said that's roughly with the naked eye roughly around a meter so from the time of uh, fajr coming in until the sun rises to the length of a spear that is the first time and it includes the two it includes two times okay so this is the simplif simplification of putting it as one time but this one time includes two times that the author mentioned the two times that the author mentioned was in from the time of fajr the adhan until the sun's disk starts to appear from the horizon and the second time the author mentioned pertaining to Fajr was from this time when the sun's disk appears from the horizon until it rises above a space length and the simplification that I'm giving you from Sheikh Abdul Salam al shawair is that we can conclude this into one time from the time of the then of Fajr until the sun has risen above the horizon the length of a spear the second time which needs no simplification is that when the sun is in the middle of the sky and then it starts to move okay that is the time when dhuhr will come in but when the time from the time that it's stuck in the middle of the sky for roughly two to three minutes this is a forbidden time the third forbidden time is from the time when a person has played salat al-asr the person he prays salat al-asr until the sun has completely set under the horizon okay so this third time includes two times that the author mentioned. The first time that the author mentioned pertaining to this time was that from the time you pray Salat al-Asr until part of the sun's disk goes below the horizon. And then the fifth time, the, the, the second time pertaining to this the author mentioned was until the whole of the sun's disk goes below the horizon. But we simplified it by saying it's from the time of Asr until the whole of the disk disappears under the horizon. So the five times have been simplified into three. The five times have been simplified into three. 
further details pertaining to this that from these five times there are long times and there are short times what are the long times the long times are from Tulu al Fajr Hatta Tulu al Shams okay from the time that Fajr comes in until the sun has risen above the horizon uh, the length of a spare this is one of the long times the second long time is from praying Salat al Asr Hatta Taghrub al Shams that from the time you have prayed Salat al Asr until the sun has completely set and the, the horizon this is the second long time okay um, the short times that the author he mentioned to us the first of them is from the disk of the uh, sun appearing above the horizon part of the disk of the sun appearing above the horizon until the sun rises or raises to more than a spear's length okay a meter above the horizon or so with the naked eye and this normally takes about 10 to 15 minutes maximum this is one of the short times another of the short times is when the sun is at its zenith okay just before the while when the sun is stuck in the sky for around two to three minutes and the third of the short times from the five the third of the short times they're too long and there's three short so the third of the short times is when the sun uh, fully sets so from when part of the sun's disk is under the horizon to when the whole of the sun's disk is under the horizon this is the third of the short times and it normally takes about 10 to 15 minutes maximum so a question to yourselves what is the benefit of this what is the benefit of knowing this distinction what is the benefit of knowing the distinction that there are short times and there are long times three short times and two long times what are the benefits from the benefits of this distinction that the authors that the scholars give that knowing that there's three short times and there's uh, two long times that the three short times they are extra severe with regards to their prohibition the prohibition is extra severe in these three short times and in the two longer times it's not as severe so in the two longer times you could do things like uh, you could pray the Salat al Janazah okay but in the shorter times you wouldn't pray the Salat al Janazah um, in the three short times because the prohibition is extra severe there so the author is now going to move on and mention which prayers are allowed as an exemption in the forbidden times okay he mentions three in the text but Sheikh Mutlaq al-Jasr and others they say that in reality there are eight which are mentioned in the madhab there are eight which are mentioned in the madhab so uh, we mentioned the eight and um, from these the eight exceptions the first of them is that you are allowed to make up the fard prayers you're allowed to make up the fard prayers okay this is the first exceptions any fard prayers which were missed let's say for example the person overslept and then they woke up and uh, now they want to pray these fard prayers so in that time the forbidden times they are allowed to pray the fard prayers and we'll take this in detail a bit later the second of these eight exemptions from that which is forbidden to pray in the forbidden times is salat al nadr Salat al-Nadr is that you have made a vow to pray to Allah Azza wa Jal, to pray to Raka'ah for example that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala cured you or protected you from something and you made a vow to pray to Allah Azza wa Jal, then this is allowed for you to be, uh, for to, to be done in the forbidden times okay the third of these uh, exemptions exceptions is the two Raka'ah of Tawaf after having made Tawaf then you are allowed or the two Raka'ah that you pray which is Sunnah to pray you can do it in the forbidden times the fourth of them is that you are allowed to repeat a congregational prayer Salat al jamaah if you are in the masjid and the iqamah is established we'll take this in a bit of detail later on because the author mentions this as one of his exceptions okay so that was one two three and four the fifth of them is that the exception is the two sunnah of fajr the two sunnah of fajr is an exception and the sixth of them is that you can pray the janazah in the long time in the two long times you could pray the janazah in the two long times however the ulama they mention if for whatever reason in the short times which is only around 10 to 15 minutes that it's feared that the body will be harmed uh, due to the heat etc then in that short time you can also pray the janazah but that's only upon the condition that you fear that the body is going to be harmed 
okay and also what you can pray as an exception number seven is the two sunnah of Salatul Dhuhr which is after Salatul Dhuhr Al-Sunnah al Ba'diyya the sunnah which is after having prayed Salatul Dhuhr uh, if you are going to join Salatul Dhuhr with Asr if you are going to join Salatul Dhuhr with Asr then it means that you have prayed Asr and now the Salah uh, any Salah is forbidden for, for you so the exception given is that the two sunnah that you would have prayed after Dhuhr you can pray at this time once you have prayed Dhuhr with Salat al-Asr. Uh, the last of them, the eighth exception according to the Hanbali scholars, is the Hayat al-Masjid on Juma when the Imam is given the khutbah. So if you ha happen to enter the Masjid uh, and the Imam is given the khutbah on Juma, then at this time it's uh, not allowed to make any salawat, but the exception is given for the Tahiyat al-Masjid. So the author now, he mentions a few, he mentions three from the eight that I've mentioned to you. The first of them he says, وَيَجُوزُ قَضَاءَ الْفَرَائِدْ فِيهَا And it's permissible to make up the obligatory prayers that have been missed in this time, okay? Because in the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ, it's narrated that he missed the Fajr prayer, okay? And this was in the Ghazwa of Khaybar. The Battle of Khaybar that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam missed the Fajr prayer and then he got up and he made this prayer with the companions and he said that whoever forgets a prayer then they should make it when they remember it because Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said establish the prayer for my, re for my remembrance. So the first of the exceptions from the uh, prayers that are allowed in the forbidden times where no other prayers are allowed according to the author al Hajawi, may Allah have mercy upon him is that you can make up the forbidden prayers. Now Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he asks a question. He said, how is it permissible, uh, how is it permissible for one to make up uh, these forbidden prayers? Because the Prophet sallallahu in many narrations has told us that one of the reasons for us not being allowed to pray in the forbidden prayers is that because what shaitan does in these forbidden times, shaitan, he places his horns between the sun. So when the sun is rising and people are going to pray at that time, shaitan, he places his horns between uh, uh, or around the sun so that people end up prostrating to him. And likewise, when the sun is setting, shaitan, he places his horns there between the sun so people end up prostrating to him. So this uh, mushabaha, this uh, resemblance to what the kuffar do, some of the kuffar do when they worship the sun, and in fact they're worshipping uh, shaitan is one of the reasons why it's prohibited to pray in these forbidden times. So Ibn Qayyim, may Allah have mercy upon him, he's saying the reason we are allowed to do so as an exception in this time is because the, the, um, the tahrim, the forbidden act of uh, doing this uh, prostration is overridden by the need to do the obligatory prayer which was missed. So by the virtue of the fact that somebody has missed an obligatory prayer, they have to make it up and it's imperative, imperative for them to do so. The second of the times that the author allows as an exception in these forbidden times, he says, And in the three short times, it's permissible for you to make uh, the tawaf. It's permissible to make the tawaf. And this is based upon a hadith in Ahmad and Abi Dawood and uh, it's authenticated by Ibn Mulaqqan. Where Jubayr ibn Mut'am, he said that the Prophet وسلم, said, Ya Bani Abd al-Manaf, O oh, tribe of Abd al-Manaf, La tamlam ahad yatufu bi hadal bayt, O yusalli ayy sa'atin sha'a fi al-layli aw min al-nahar, min al-layli aw nahar. O oh, tribe of Abd al-Manaf, do not prevent anybody who wants to make tawaf around this Kaaba, around this house, or pray in this house, any time during the day or during the night. So here the Prophet ﷺ clearly said that tawaf okay, can be done at any time during the day or the night. So the author he said, وَفِي الْأَوْقَاتِ thalatha, And these three times the tawaf is allowed to be done and we gave you the evidence why the tawaf is allowed to be done. Question to yourselves, why did the author mention the three times and he didn't mention the five times? Why did he mention the three times and he didn't mention the five times? Question to yourselves. Tayyib, barakallahu feek, jazakallahu khair for your interaction. Um, 
that's not correct. What we said is that the three times, the three short times, that's where the prohibition is more stressed. The prohibition is more stressed there. And the two longer times, you could actually, it's, it's a lesser prohibition. So the reason the author mentioned the three times where it's more stressed that you cannot do uh, acts of worship, the salah, is because that if it's allowed, if the tawaf is allowed in these three times, then from in Bab al-Awla, then more so, it's going to be allowed in the two times, the two longer times. So that's why the author, the author only mentioned uh, the three times. Because if it's allowed in the three times, then more so, min Bab al-Awla, it's going to be allowed in the longer two times. Okay? And that was mentioned by Sheikh Mansur Saqib in his explanation. Tayyip. The author, the third thing that the author allows as an exemption from uh, the forbidden times, praying in the forbidden times, he says, وَإِعَادَةُ جَمَاعَةٍ He says, وَإِعَادَةُ جَمَاعَةٍ It's allowed for you to repeat the prayer in congregation. Now this is only allowed with the condition, and this doesn't matter whether you prayed on your own at home, or you prayed in a jama'ah somewhere else. Okay, so let's say for example, you prayed in jama'ah in a particular masjid, which happened to pray like 15 minutes before another masjid. And then you went to the second masjid to uh, attend uh, a fiqh class, for example. And uh, the iqama is given in that masjid. So you've already prayed in jama'ah. The author is saying it's allowed for you to repeat this prayer in jama'ah, okay, in the, forbi in the forbidden time. So you prayed Salatul uh, Fajr. So now after having prayed Salat al-Fajr, there's no other Salah which is allowed upon you. Or you prayed Salat al-Asr, and there's no other prayer after that which is allowed for you. However, the exception is that if you are in the masjid and an iqamah is given, then it's allowed for you to join that congregation, to join that jama'ah. Okay, even if you prayed in jama'ah beforehand. So this is the exception. But with the condition that you are there from the time when the iqamah is given. Okay, you are from there from the time when the iqamah is given. And... The evidence for this is in Tirmidhi, where the Prophet ﷺ, he prayed in Hajj in Mina, okay, in Masjid al khayf And after he had finished praying, he saw that there were two uh, companions anhuma, that didn't join the prayer. So the Prophet ﷺ ordered that they be brought to his attention. And they were brought to the Prophet ﷺ in a state of fear and, you know, quite panicking as to why does the Prophet ﷺ want us. So the Prophet ﷺ said, ما منعكما أن تصلي معنا What prevented you from praying with us? They said, يا رسول الله قد صلينا في رحالنا They said, O oh Prophet of Allah, we had already prayed in our dwellings. So the Prophet ﷺ said, لا تفعلا Don't do that. إذا صليتك إذا صليتما في رحالكما ثم أتيتما مسجد جماعة فصليا معهم فإنها لكما نافلة The Prophet ﷺ said, If you have already prayed, in your dwellings, and then you come to a masjid where the jama'ah is being established, then pray with them, for verily it will be for you as a supererogatory prayer, it will be for you a nafal prayer. So here, these guys, they had already prayed fajr, which means that any prayer after fajr wouldn't, wouldn't be allowed. However, because they were in the masjid and the iqamah was established, the Prophet ﷺ told them that don't do this again in the future. Rather, if you are there when the iqamah is established, then pray with the jama'ah again. So I mentioned to you that the opinion of the madhab is that it, this can only happen if the iqam is established, right? And there is a second riwaya in the madhab which says that it can be established. Uh, you can join the uh, second jama'ah or you can uh, pray again with the jama'ah even if you weren't there from the time of the iqamah. But the relied upon opinion is as I explained that the condition has to be that the, you are there from the time that the iqamah has been established. The author, may Allah have mercy upon him, he says, وَيَحْرَمُوا تَطَوُّعٌ بِغَيْرِهَا فِي شَيْءٍ مِنَ الْأَوْقَاتِ الْخَمْسَةِ حَتَّى مَا لَهُ سَبَبٌ He says, the author, may Allah have mercy upon him, apart from what I have mentioned to you, the author is saying the three exceptions that I have mentioned to you, then it's forbidden for you to do any supererogatory prayers, any nafil prayers or sunnah prayers in these five, excuse me, in the five uh, forbidden times. Even if the prayer is that which has a reason to do so. What he means by the reason to do so is a salawat dhat al asbab The prayers which have reasons. For example, like tahiyyut al-masjid. Tahiyyut al-masjid is known as salatul dhat al-asbab. 
it has a reason for you to pray which is that when you are entering upon the masjid you have you you have to then pray two rakat so it's not an open it's not a nafil mutlaq it's not an open nafil which has no reason attached to it whereby you just feel like praying a nafil he's not referring to that he's referring to well he's referring to that and he's saying even those uh, nawafil and those sunan which have reasons like tahirat al-masjid for example or salat al-kusuf etc you're not allowed to do them in the forbidden times okay so the only prayers that the author allows you to do in the forbidden times are the three that he mentioned which was number one to make up the uh, missed obligatory prayers and number two uh, number two was to what subhanallah Number two was to, uh, if you repeat the jama'ah, number two was to repeat the jama'ah, and number three, you guys can look back because my mind has gone black. So in any case, the author, he says, these uh, no prayers apart from these three are allowed to be done in the forbidden times, and uh, even if they are dhat al-asbab, even if they are um, sunan prayers or nawafil prayers that have a reason, like tahir al-masjid or salat al-kusuf, However, another opinion in the Hanbali Madhab held by some of the latter scholars uh, and uh, Ibn Abdus, they said, for example, any prayer which is Datul Asbab, any of the prayers which are Datul Asbab, which have reasons like Salatul Kusuf or Tihayatul Masjid, you are allowed to do in the uh, forbidden times. Okay? So the second riwayah in the Hanbali Madhab is that Fi'lu Datul Asbab you are allowed to do in the forbidden times but our author he said only the th uh, the three exceptions which he said are allowed to be done Taib, we'll move on now with Allah's permission to Babu Salatul Jama'a to the um, chapter wherein the author is going to speak about the rulings pertaining to congregation Salah and this is very important to know because of course we are recommended to pray in congregation and of course it's imperative for us now that we are praying at home with our families etc to know these details uh, in in depth so bab salatul jama'a the issues pertaining to praying in congregation ibn taymiyyah before we go on he said in his fatawa he said a'immatul muslimin muttafiquna ala anna iqamata salawat al-khams fi al-masajid hiya min a'dham al-ibadat wa ajal al-qurubat he said that it's agreed upon with all scholars that to pray the five daily salawat in the masajid is from the best of the acts of worship that one can do. It's from the best of the acts of worship that one can do. In Sahih Muslim, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam narrated from the hadith of Ibn Umar, Salatul Rajul, Salatul Jama'ati, Aftul Min Salatul Faddi, Bi Sab'in Wa Ishrina Daraja. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that for a person to pray in jama'ah, is better than him praying by himself by 27 levels and you get 27 times more reward than a person would if they were to pray alone you pray in jama'ah you get 27 times more reward and also in Sahih muslim a very important hadith that we should reflect upon with the hadith of abdullah ibn masudin abdullah ibn masudin he said Man sarra an ghadan musliman. whoever is pleased to meet allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a muslim on the day of judgment then this person should ensure that he establishes the prayers in the masajid. Wherever the adhan is given, the person is there to pray these salawat. For very Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has established for your Prophet ways of guidance. And verily these establishing the prayers in the masajid are from the ways of guidance. And if you were to do what these people who go against the sunnah do by praying in their houses and not praying in the masajid, you would have left out the ways of guidance and the sunnah of guidance that the Prophet ﷺ established. وَلَوْ تُرَكْتُمْ سُنَّةَ النَّبِيِّكُمْ لَضَلَلْتُمْ And if you leave, Abdullah bin Masood is saying, if you leave the sunnah of your Prophet وسلم, then you will be misguided. وَمَا مِنْ رَجْلٍ يَتَطَهَّرُ فَيُحْسِنُ الطُّهُورُ ثُمَّ يَعْمِدُوا إِلَى مَسْجِدٍ مِنْ حَادِ الْمَسَاجِدِ إِلَّا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَهُ بِكُلِّ خَطْوَةٍ يَخْطُوهَا حَسَنًا وَيَرْفَعُهُ بِهَا دَرَجًا And there is no person except that he perfects wudu, does wudu in a good way, 
and then goes out intentionally to the masajid that whenever he takes a step Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove a sin from him and will raise him in rank uh, for each step and remove a sin وَلَقَدْ رَأَيْتُنَا وَمَا يَتَّخَلَّفُ عَنْهَا إِلَّا مُنَافِقٌ مَعْلُومٌ نفاق. And it would be seen in our time, Abdullah ibn Masood is saying in the time of the companions, that none would stay away from praying in the masajid except for somebody who was well known to be a person of having nifaq, meaning a munafiq who was well known. Subhanallah. وَلَقَدْ كَانَ رَجُلُ يُؤْتَى بِهِ يُحَادَ بَيْنَ رَجُلَيْنَ حَتَّى يُقَامْ فِي الصف. And verily, a man from amongst us who wasn't feeling well, who was sick, who had something wrong with him, he would be brought to the masjid uh, balancing upon two people. His arms would be around two people until he was put in the row for him to pray. So even the person who had an excuse, he would still bring, get somebody to help him to bring him to the masjid. So the hadith clearly shows us how the companions would see Salat al jamaah and how important it is supposed to be in the society of the Muslims. Tayyip, there are benefits from praying in Salat al jamaah Give me please some of the benefits of praying in Salat al jamaah What are some of the benefits, as a question to yourselves, from praying in congregation Salat? Very good, Barakallah Feek. That is from them that the community has the sense of unity, that they are praying together as brothers, their shoulders next to each other, the feet next to each other, the black and the white, the rich and the poor. It's of no consequence. We pray together to one Qibla, to one Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it encourages unity. And also the ulama, they mentioned that it hurts the kuffar, that when they see that the Muslims are together as one unit, as one family, loving each other for the sake of Allah, praying to one Lord, this is something which enrages those who have hatred and enmity towards Islam. So it's something which is encouraged to do. And also, it helps the person to be active with regards to his prayers and not to be lazy. Because when you hear the adhan, you know that you have to respond. And, you are, and, and it prevents you from being lazy as one may be if they were to pray by themselves at home. Some of the ulama, like Sheikh uh, Mansur Saqib, they say that um, the salah, it varies in degrees of reward based upon certain variables, okay? So the salat al jamaat the congregation prayer, varies in degrees of reward based upon certain variables. From these variables is that the virtue of the place increases the reward. So for example, obviously, as we know, if you were to pray in Mecca, or in the Haram of Medina, in the Masjid al Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then your rewards will be multiplied in the thousands. So by virtue of praying congregation in those masajid, you get a lot more reward. And also, one of the reasons why your reward is increased, that if you were to pray jama'ah in a masjid, rather than praying jama'ah at work, or in a, uh, uh, for example, uh, people gathered at your house and you want to pray jama'ah there, if you were to pray in the masjid, you would get a lot more reward. And also the ulama they mentioned, Sheikh Saqib, he mentions that if you were to pray Salat al-Asr in Jama'ah, that is more rewarding than the other Salawat in Jama'ah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. The author, may Allah have mercy upon him, he says, Talzam al-Rijalu as salawat al-Khams. He said it's wajib, Talzam, he means here by this word Talzam, that it's obligatory, it's wajib upon men to pray Salawat al-Khams in congregation. Okay? Al-Ahrar, those who are free, Al-Qadirin, and those who have the ability, as mentioned by Sheikh Muhammad Bajabir. So the author, he mentions that it's obligatory upon the men, and we added two more conditions, that, that they are free, Al-Ahrar, and the Qadirin, that they have the ability to pray with uh, the Imam in the Masjid, meaning that they are of good health, etc. So the Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, وَإِذَا كُنْتَ فِيهِمْ فَأَقَمْتَ لَهُمَ الصَّلَاةِ فَلْتَكُمْ طَائِفَةٌ فَلْتَكُمْ طَائِفَةٌ مِّنْهُمْ مَعَكَ The O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you have established a prayer with the companions, then ensure that a group of them, they stand with you to pray. This is in fact pertaining to the salah al-khawf, the salah that you pray when you are um, fearing from an enemy, etc. Okay, even in those times, you have to establish the Salat al jamaah So how more important then in times when people are living in safety and not in fear, etc. from an enemy? So the ayah clearly says that when the Prophet ﷺ or the Imam or anybody uh, wants to pray, that they should pray in jamaah with those who are with them. The Prophet ﷺ said in Sahih Muslim, 
It's narrated by Abu Hurairah radiyallahu anhu. أَتَى رَجْلٌ أَعْمَى إِلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم فَقَالَ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِنِّي لَيْسَ لِي قَائِدٌ يَقُودُنِي إِلَى الْمَسْجِدِ That a man came to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and he was blind. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, I don't have anybody that can take me to the masjid. فَسَأَلَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم أَنْ يُرَخِّصَ لَهُ أَنْ يُصَلِّ فِي الْبَيْتِ So he asked the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم to give him permission to pray in the house. فَرَخَّصَ لَهُ صلى الله عليه وسلم And the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم gave him permission. فَلَمَّا وَلَّا دَعَهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم So as the man, the blind man was leaving, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, هَلْ تَسْمَعُ النِّدَى Do you hear the call to prayer? And the, and the man said, Naam. The Prophet said, Fa'ajib. The Prophet said, Then you have to respond to the call of prayer. So look here, this is a man who was blind and he didn't have anybody to guide him to the masjid. But by virtue of the fact that he was in the vicinity where he could hear the adhan, it meant that he had to respond to the prayer in the masjid. So it shows us that it's obligatory upon every individual that has the ability to get to the masjid, that he can walk to the masjid. Uh, and he's in the vicinity of being able to hear the adhan without the microphone, then he has to respond to the masjid to, to pray in jama'ah. The author says, la shartan, not conditional. What he means here, not conditional, he said it's wajib to pray uh, in congregation, but it's not a condition for his salah to be valid. So you have two things here. You have the condition and you have the obligation of praying in congregation. So the author is saying that it's not conditional. It's not a condition for your salah to be valid. Okay, sihatu salah. That if you were to pray not in jama'ah, your salah will still be valid. However, you left out a wajib, which was to respond or to pray in congregation, and therefore you're sinful for having done so, unless you had an excuse not to respond to praying in the jama'ah. Tayyib. So it's not a condition. Your salah will be still be valid if the person didn't pray in jama'ah, the man didn't pray in jama'ah. However, the uh, person would incur a sin from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for having left out the wajib. وَلَهُ فِعْلُهَا فِي بَيْتِهِ And it's permitted for the person to pray the jama'ah in the house. Okay, the mashhur in the madhab, the mashhur, the famous opinion in the madhab is that salat al-jama'ah, congregation prayer, can be done in other than the masjid. It can be done in the marketplaces, it can be done in the houses, Okay, it can be done in schools, etc. This is the famous opinion in the madhab. That, with, what do they base this on? They base this upon the hadith in Bukhari with Jabir ibn Abdullah. He said that the Prophet ﷺ said, أُعْتِيتُ خَمْسْ لَمْ يُعْتَهُنَّ أَحَدٌ قَبْلِي And then he said from amongst these, the Prophet ﷺ said, I've been given five, nobody was given them before me. Five gifts from Allah Azawajal, nobody was given them before me. And one of them he mentioned, وَجُعِلَتْ لِي الْأَرْضِ مَسْجِدْ مسجدا مطهورا فأيما رجل من أمتي أدرك الصلاة أدركة الصلاة فليصلي. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said that the whole of the earth was made for me as a masjid and a place of purity. So any person that salah comes upon him, then they should pray wherever they are. So this hadith clearly states that you are allowed to uh, pray outside of the masjid. Okay, meaning that you can have the salat al jama in other than the masjid. So that is the famous opinion in the madhab. However, there's another riwayah from Imam Ahmad held by Ibn Qudama, okay, and others that the salah to jamaah has to be and should be in the masjid. That it's not allowed for you to do salah to jamaah outside of the masjid. And this is, yani, this is quite a strong opinion because in Bukhari, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam once, he said, Hamamtu an amru bi salah tuqam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, I desired to ordered that the salah would be established. And then I would leave with a group of people who would gather firewood. And we would go to the houses of those people that didn't respond to praying in the masjid and we would set their houses alight, subhanAllah. So the Prophet ﷺ wouldn't say this in an issue where it's allowed for you to abstain from the jama'ah, right? So the Prophet ﷺ in that hadith in Bukhari is saying that we, I, I wish to have gone to those houses to have burnt them down. So to prevent the people from praying in congregation at home and to ensure that they pray from congregation in the masjid. So this is the second opinion uh, which is strong in the madhab. However, the author he said, which was the relied upon opinion, that salat al jamaah can be done outside of the masjid. The author he says, وَتُسْتَحَبُّ صَلَاتُ أَهْلِ الثَغْرِ فِي مَسْجِدْ وَاحِدْ Actually, what I'll do, I'll stop here in fact and we won't go on any further. 
uh, taking these further details because I'm feeling a bit dizzy from my fast today. I'm diabetic. May Allah Azza give me shifa. And it's a bit hard to concentrate. So we'll stop here. And uh, if you have any questions pertaining to what we've taken so far, then feel free. If not, then I ask Allah Azza wa to protect all of us from any harm, to increase us in our Iman in this blessed month of Ramadan, and to give it the best of opportunities for gaining Laylatul Qadr. Ameen. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you have any questions, then feel free. If not, then we'll bring the class to a close, inshallah.